Hello there, it's Philosophy Sunday today and so I won't be talking about prog or jazz rock or even classic rock. I won't be using the superiorometer. I'll be talking about something else, right? That's what I do on a Sunday, I talk about something else. And I thought, because I'm talking about something else, it'd be a nice change of scenery if I sat in a different place in my studio. So I'm sat here. It's very nice at this end, it's over by my drum kit, isn't it? It's very lovely, isn't it? You know, um, don't my symbols look lovely in the background there? They do, they, look, at that, 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 look at this big ride symbol here, the beauty here, with the, with the light gently gleaming off. It looks, it looks very pretty, doesn't it? Yes, I, I think so too, yes, yes. I'm glad you think that. They're beautiful symbols, by the way. These are, these are dream symbols. Um, I play dream symbols, the best symbols in the world. Wonderful symbols. I searched for years to get the sound I wanted, and I didn't get the sound I wanted until I found dream symbols, the incredible symbols. So if you are a drummer out there and you want to uh, get some really great symbols, you know, I, I can't... Uh, you know, I can't tell you how great these symbols are. They're the, they're the symbols I play. And, in, and if you like my drum sound, you like my cymbal sound, then it's these symbols here. That's what you're hearing, the dream symbols. Um, so, as you can see, I'm making a point, And I am also pushing my wonderful symbols because they are wonderful symbols. But I'm making a point that the business we're in is always tied in some way to product placement or making a profit, or, or, or in some way, everybody's trying to make some money out of this business. And when you're on a YouTube, what you're doing is you're making people look, you know, I made you look, I made you stare, you know. Um, if I've done that and you're watching at the moment, you are looking this way. And because you're looking this way, I have your attention. And people can sell you stuff consciously and subconsciously I could have not mentioned these symbols and you would have looked at them and you might have wondered what those symbols are and you might have zoomed in and seen the dream logo you know um, you, you might notice I'm also wearing this lovely black t-shirt here isn't that nice and you can see here oh those wrong 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 chest here I have the Load Street Studios logo. They were local studios to me. I'm very good friends with the um, owner of those studios, who is called Steve Carrigan, who also runs an amazing um, business called Carrigan Events. So if you live in the West Midlands and you want to rehearse or record or you want someone to put on, you know, staging, do live sound, you know, Carrigan Events is an amazing uh, organisation for doing that. So um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting so, I mean, the thing is you, you, you can see my beautiful symbols and you can see my lovely uh, T-shirt, can't you? Um, but I can't see them. I'm just going to have a look around and see, you know, just have a look at these lovely symbols. Aren't they nice? They're lovely, aren't they? Oh, look at those symbols. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> right, have I made my point? <laughs> so, um, product placement. That is the way music makes its money now, predominantly. Not so much from record sales, not so much from live gigs. That's all there and it all goes into the pot. Not so much from royalties, it's all there. But on the whole, um, Music now has to draw people in, get their attention, and then the advertisers come in and they stick their adverts next to it. And uh, you'll notice as I do this video, um, you will see adverts flashing up in a very annoying fashion all the way through it. Now, those adverts have been picked particularly, specifically for you to look at, all right? Because we live in an age now with the internet where the ability to sell stuff to people has just gone through the roof. They know who you are. They know what you like. They know you like jazz rock. They know that you're probably a middle-aged male, probably. You know, you might, because you like prog, you might be a little bit nerdy. You might work in IT and you might have a very particular interest and approach in technical objects and you might find those are the sort of adverts or maybe you're a musician and maybe there's loads of adverts coming up trying to sell you midi packs or trying to get you involved in something else right so this is the business we're in right i'm completely aware of this and i have to go away as a youtuber and try and think of something that people will want to watch that's always the big thing for me is 
there's all sorts of videos I'd like to do, but you have to ask yourself, how many people are actually gonna look at that? And there's a really common thing that happens on my uh, YouTube comments where someone says, oh, you must do a, um, something on this band some obscure Bulgarian prog band and uh, I know if I did that video it would get no views whatsoever. Um, another thing that's awful is if I do reviews of new music. Um, I've got an album at the moment and see now I'm doing it again. <laughs> yeah, new album out called Fabella which is on my band camp and uh, the link is in there. You can go and check it out and buy it and send me some money and all that bit. Um, so I've been sending my, my um, album out to other YouTubers and a couple of them have come back and said, oh, I'm, I'm not doing so many of the uh, uh, reviews of new albums because nobody ever looks, nobody ever watches. They're not interested. Right, we know what we know, we like what we like and that's what we're going to look at and the um, powers that be that run our world are aware of that and they've analysed those likes that you've got and they are going to push stuff your way. Okay, so that is the way money is made at the moment. Um, in the past, bands would make their money primarily out of record sales. And that's diminished and it's changed the industry. Now, I've spoken about that elsewhere at length. On this video, what I want to do is discuss this idea that if you are popular, if you are making money, if, you, if you're not thinking about your own personal artistic um, expression and you'll focus more on what I'm doing sometimes, not always, um, on trying to draw people in to look, that, it, that in some way diminishes the art. And that's a very common um, comment that I have on my YouTube and the reason is, is because when I do my ranking and now I've got the superiorometer and I've, uh, I've put this um, attribute into the superiorometer so this is, a, this is an attribute by which the superiorometer measures how good somebody is. One of those attributes is how popular it is. Because how popular it is, is like saying, how many people like this? And if lots of people like something, I think we can sort of stand back objectively and say, well, it must be good because there's a lot, there's an average, there's an average, more people like this, so it must, more ha it must have more goodness in it. But of course, those people who are interested in more obscure music, they sort of look down their noses at these people that can't understand this very complex music. And, that, and I've dealt with that on a video recently. So this is always cropped up. And if you are a musician or artist watching this, you may be um, wondering whereabouts you should place yourself on the um, spectrum between artist expression artistic expression, sorry, and uh, commercial appeal. And I really want to get into that on this video. And uh, I, sh I think now I should really get into it because I've been, uh, I've done eight minutes of introduction and a, a few more minutes of uh, product placement. So anyway, is it still in view? Yes, you can still see it. Right, so um, if you think of that spectrum, at the one end we have complete artistic expression at the other we have com complete commerciality so if you're an artist if you're thinking of com complete commerciality you're considering your audience completely you are thinking I wonder what they like I wonder whether they'll like this and this really subsumes the music industry um, working in the industry and making records I've become very aware of the things that you need to do to make people like it and this is a lot of the time what producers are doing they're sat there going oh you know this this introduction has gone on for far too long and uh, we can cut this introduction off in fact let's just get straight to the chorus you know because when someone clicks on this they're only gonna they're gonna four seconds we've got until they make a judgment where they're like let's stick the hook at the front and let's make the hook really loud all these are the considerations so at, at this end let's get the right one at this end here we have complete consideration of the audience. The audience is, is making the decision for you. It needs your subjective view of what you think the audience likes. And that's the Achilles heel of that. It's because we, nobody really knows what the audience likes. Because if they did, obviously the record companies would just continually churn out stuff that sells millions and millions and draws loads of viewers and listeners in. But they don't because it's not an exact silence. Now at the other end here, this person here, 
has got no interest in what anybody thinks, right? Now, if you're this person here, how the hell are you going to fund what you're doing? Because making music costs money. I'm sat in front of thousands of pounds worth of drum kit. I've got thousands of pounds worth of recording studio over there. Um, if I want to put product out, I need to market it. I need to push it out there. You know, I, I need to, you know, manufacture. It costs money. The whole thing costs money. And more, more importantly, it, it costs your time. And of course, time is money. So um, the only way you can be at this end is by having some financial backing yourself. Now, what's very interesting is a lot of people in the industry who make it to this end actually start off at this end. They have money behind them. They have the money themselves to put, put the integrate in the product of not having to go to a job all day long. They can spend all day on their music. They can travel. They can fly out to like Nam or they can fly out to South by Southwest and they can mooch around because they got money, right? So this is, this is really now where we start to get into this thing. So often when you look at music, which is a little bit more esoteric, uh, the people who are making that are often from quite a privileged background because how did they get there in the first place making such weird music they they needed to fund it in some way you know um, the poor do not make complex esoteric difficult music they are much more interested in just getting through the day now one of the wonderful things about rock and roll was rock and roll um, throughout its history it ebbed between but complex, difficult, arty music, and that's the music we talk about on this channel, the prog and the fusion and all that stuff. And then it would swing over to much more visceral, simple forms. And these simple forms were, were accessible to the normal person. So here in the UK, we had the skiffle movement in the 1950s, and people could basically make their own music. And those musicians from working class backgrounds who could do that then went on to change the music industry. I'm thinking about people like the Beatles and all those, those like Jimmy Page, although I think Jimmy Page is pretty middle class to start with. But anyway, these people were able to access um, creative making. And then that, when that, that voice was heard, that voice spoke to the vast amount of people because vast amount of people aren't rich. And, the, and it chimed with them and they jumped on it. You know, the same thing happened in the 70s and here in the UK with punk rock. It also happened uh, with hip hop in America. Two turntables and a microphone and you can make music. Um, it happened at the beginning of the sort of rave dance music thing where people could write, buy relatively cheap gear like an Akai sampler uh, and you know a basic sequencer and they could make records in their bedroom. They could stick them out on white labels. They could, they could get them in the hands of DJs who were doing illegal raves and they could play that and they could get the music out there, right? So, this thing I'm describing has got all different facets to it, right? But basically, you've got a choice between ha being able to fund it yourself and being able to make the music and just don't, you don't care about what the audience thinks, or you can try and consider the audience. Now, often with musicians, the problem is, is that um, on the one end, there's a lot of people who are making very, very inaccessible, obscure music and then get very frustrated because nobody wants to listen to it, right? And uh, there's a certain contingent that will look at that and say, well, what do you expect? Nobody wants to listen to this. It's got no vocals on it. It's got no tune. It's all abstract and weird, you know. And uh, if you go to the other end, uh, artists are totally trying to make commercial music. The other contingent will go, well, how can you see that as a valid artistic expression if they're being so driven by what they think someone else will like? You know, what do they really like and what do they really think? Um, you, you often have the feeling that um, real superstar pop artists, you know, these sort of ones that have got the gig because they look really good and they can sing a bit. I often wonder what music they like because I'm pretty sure they don't like the music they're making. You know, I'm pretty sure they go home and listen to all sorts of weird, interesting music, but they're in a different game, right? I'm trying to explain how complex this is and it becomes really uh, apparent when you start to look at the middle ground here, right? Because in the middle here is, is a ton of music that has got both considerations going on. And often when you look at the history of music, people who have erred more towards just doing what they wanted, but were um, 
involved in the cultural zeitgeist, that's the second time I've used this word recently, um, or they, they, they were culturally placed in a certain time and place, what they just want to do, the, the, that, that love and, and um, attachment to, do, to express themselves, chimes accidentally. A lot of the big changes in music that happen, happen in this middle ground, right? And so, my uh, take on this is because, once you're aware of the complexity of this, these musicians who are expressing themselves from the heart, right? How do we classify whether what they're doing is any good? So, the one parameter you would use to go, well, they really like it. So that's their subjective personal taste. And that sits, where are we? Here. Subjective personal taste sits here. And that's your taste. In my case, it's my taste. So when you come to you, the, this YouTube, one of the parameters you're going to get is my personal taste, which is entirely subjective. But I'm also going to try and balance that, and this is why I take this into account, by thinking, well, I know I like this, but what does everyone else like? And if something else is popular, that will influence my judgment on how good it is. All right? Um, often, if you take a band you like, you know, or even a band you don't like, but it's say if you take a band you like. So let's take um, Pink Floyd. So Pink Floyd's two biggest albums, I would say, would be Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall. Now, the question is, are those two albums their best two albums? Well, it's because we're in that middle ground, it's a grey area. But without doubt, Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall are at the upper echelons of that grade. If we took a band like Led Zeppelin, the biggest selling album is probably the untitled album Led Zeppelin 4 with Stay to Heaven on it and Physical Graffiti. Many people would also say those albums are the best albums they ever made. And so I think in terms of what the fan's personal taste is, right, and also then the, the looking at the average of the general public, there seems to be a correlation to me in terms of um, artistic worth and popularity. In other words, what I'm saying is, is that popularity is a litmus test to whether something's good, but it's not the only one. And this is what people don't seem to understand. When I do my superiority rankings, superiometer rankings, sorry, um, what I'm doing is I'm trying to put as many factors in as I can. I'm putting 10 factors in so that I can score them on all these different things and then sort of get an average. And this is something nobody really does. Most people just do it on one parameter and that's what they like. And you've got to remember what you like is based upon three um, uh, sort of influences. The first one is your biology. There are things in music that everybody seems to like or have an ear for at least. They have an ear for things which are in time and they have an ear for things that are in tune. They have an ear for certain harmonies. That seems built in and we see that playing out across all different music forms. Um, the second one is your cultural heritage. It's where you, you're brought up and what's around you culturally. You know, So somebody grown up in Britain like me, um, you know, I will like bands that I heard when I was growing up because I was in that this country, you know, and this is why when you go to somewhere like, you know, Indonesia, they like different music. This is quite obvious as well. So that's, that's the second parameter. And the third parameter is your own personal history. What did your parents play? You know, what did your mates play? You know, it, did something happen to you specific where you suddenly got introduced to some, you know, weird music form because your, your, your dad was of some weird folk artist and you followed him around. So you've got an interest in that. So those three parameters also affect our subjective view. And if you look at those, the biology one is objective, the cultural one is sort of in the middle, and the personal history is entirely subjective, right? And this is something that I have great difficulty explaining to people who watch this channel. When you're making these judgments, they're actually very complex. And the truth is we can't get to an objective view of what is good. There is no such thing. My superiorometer is actually a parody. It's a satire on that. You know, the fact that it supposedly is this machine that operates in an almost like clunky computer way to be able to objectively come up with what is good or what is bad. That is a parody on it. 
So why would you want to watch it when I'm telling you that it's a, it's a, it's a nonsense? The reason is, is because the evaluation of art, the evaluation in this way, is of value and we enjoy it. You watch it because you enjoy it and I enjoy doing them. It's interesting because art is what we use to gauge quality and it's up for negotiation and so it's the way human, human beings negotiate quality. So when we think of it in those terms, this idea that, um, that, that uh, lots of people evaluating quality should be discounted in trying to evaluate quality is an absolute, it's, it's, a, it's nonsensical, okay? So um, the question is then, and I'm going to move on to this now, if you are an artist, I believe, and I've tried to teach this to my students, the question is, is asking whereabouts you want to be on here. You're right. Do you want to be this end where you just want to make your own music? Well, if you do and you don't want any commercial considerations, stop worrying about whether people like it. Stop looking at views. Stop doing all that and try and work a way of sustaining your music making another way. In other words, go and get a job so you can pay for it or maybe join some covers band that plays music you don't like. You can take that money and do it. All right, and when you make that music, if you've made music that you really love, then don't get bogged down into whether people like it and start moaning because no one listens to it. Um, and you never know. They may listen to it because you can fluke it. You can just express yourself and people love it. And that also is um, a criticism against these comments where say, oh, it's popular. So just because something's popular is not, doesn't mean it's good. There is loads of music out there that is extremely popular that is also really a 100% a, a commercial, 100% uh, um, artistic expression where commerciality hasn't figured that much. It just happened to be more commercial. If you're here this end, right, and you want to really be popular, then you're going to have to study what people like. You're going to have to look at trends. You're going to have to look at demographics. You're going to have to look at the sort of music you're making and then look at other bands that are making similar music and, and see how they do it and what they do and where their audience is. Now, the back end of this uh, little um, discussion on commerciality is I now want to talk a little bit about the way things are now because um, the digital age has thrown a whole bunch of things in the mix. And we've talked about it on this channel. Obviously, people can now make music um, at home in their bedroom. They don't have to go to a million pound studio and spend 500 quid a day recording their stuff. They can make high quality music in their bedrooms. This is a democratization of the creative process, all right? And that's, that's more positive in terms of people being able to express themselves and get their music out there. Digital technologies have also democratised the distribu distribution of music. So, you know, all of us can now get a track that is accessible to everybody with an internet connection all over the world. Those are two wonderful things, but the problem is there's now so many people doing that, right? And the internet has, has made a way of making money out of it. All right, so if you've made a track and you want to put it up on Spotify and all the other streaming platforms, you will have to go to some sort of website and you'll put your track in. And that track um, may get virtually no views, but you are most likely paying to get that there. So the, the music industry has now found a way of making money out of these people who are doing it for the love. Um, your song on there will probably get 17 or 18 views. Okay. Now in terms of advertising revenue, that's minuscule but when you take the whole of Spotify and add it all up you've realized that there's a whole plethora of acts that are making themselves much money but as if you add it all up those those tiny you know decimal place percentage points of cents or pence or whatever are adding up if you think about YouTube you know YouTube has adverts on all videos so if you're not monetized and you're sticking your videos up trying to push your band and you're getting 200 views if you think of all the YouTubes, that cash from that ad revenue, which is tiny, then adds up and it floats into a YouTube's coffers, right? Uh, and this is the point. So the democratization of music creation has also democratized getting ripped off. 
we could all get ripped off now. As soon as you go into this, you know, as soon as you've made a track in your bedroom and stuck it up on SoundCloud, you have entered into the music industry and you could be honored in knowing that like all the great artists, you'd be ripped off straight away and someone's making money out of you that you're not making. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing that this happens. Um, so if you are uh, in the middle, let's talk about the person in the middle. The, the, and this is where genre comes in. A lot of people will like certain genres, and those genres are obscure. Um, and it's not so much about pandering to commerciality, it's more about pandering to the genre. And that's where a lot of the discussions on this channel um, sort of revolve around. Is, is this prog? Is this jazz? What's jazz? What's this? Because we all want to know where it's, it's fitted into the genre, because it fits into the genre, and then the people who have signed up to that genre We'll come and have a look. That's that's the concept. And in doing that, the internet then get, get specific information from that audience and they can sell specifically. So niche music and niche artists have fared really well from the internet. And my advice at the end of this video as I get to the last bit is if you are an artist and you're trying to break out, you really need to stop thinking about that old school commercial, you know, let's sell a million records, Michael Jackson, Thriller, all that type of thing. Forget about all that because the big companies do that. Until you get access to the big companies that can really throw millions at marketing in this, you're not going to get anywhere near it. You know, the, the irony of this conversation is right at the end when you really look at it, if you are making esoteric music, then what you've got to do is find where that audience is online. That's what you need to do. And if you can find that audience, you may be able to just create, say, 100 or 200 people out there that like what you're doing and will buy your album. And if you're selling your album for 10 quid online, that's 2,000 quid. If you're um, making, say, three albums a year, because you can, because you're autonomous and you've uh, worked out how to sustain your music making, then that's six grand. And six grand should be able to fund you in sustaining your music making. You can have the best of both worlds. So. If the internet is such a wonderful place, why does it feel like it's not? Now that's a question for another video. I think the truth is, it is a wonderful place and the internet's a better situation than it used to be, right? The downside of it is the democratization um, may have dumbed down the audience and may maybe allowed people who shouldn't be allowed to be making music because it's rubbish into the market which then obscures all the good stuff and that the old way of having to get a record deal that filter actually had a use but of course that filter was only in any ever any good when they were in the business of actually selling music that people wanted to buy and own now it's not like that now you're making music to try and make you look now what's interesting for me is that i've spent my whole life working in esoteric music forms that's why I know about this. I didn't know that about this when I was 20 years old. I thought, like most idiots, that I could make obscure proggy jazz rock and somehow have a career in this. In, and uh, I played in some reasonable bands and made a lot of albums, but the actual money from that was, it was very small. And I've spoken to people who have told me about absolute legends, people that we talk about all day long on this channel, and I've been told that these guys do not make a living out of music. The, the, the money comes from elsewhere. It's, it's a fascinating thing, this is. Um, now, my love of all this music has been able to, for me to create an audience. I now have an audience and you're watching it. And now because I have that audience, I, even though I'm talking about such weird, obscure stuff, there's enough to, to, to sustain me in what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that in the future, once the, you know, the views have really got up, that, uh, you know, commercial entities will, will want to come and place their products. So this video is really... You know, I'm just showing off, really, that I could be placing some products, you know. I, I could have, you know, there's a little space here. See that space? I could have anything in the back there, couldn't I? Anything, you know, I could have, like, a toilet brushes, you know. I need a toilet brush at the moment, and uh, I went out looking for one. And they're very cheap toilet brushes. What did you expect they would be? Because, uh, you know, you know, I think people change them quite a lot. If you don't change a toilet brush very often, it's a, it's a sign that things aren't going well, isn't it? Anyway, I, I have got to that point where I know I am now going to start rambling. And I know you all like it, but um, I'm on a bit of a thing to try and just pull my videos down and make it a bit shorter. They do got, go on sometimes. That's another criticism I get, you know. Anyway, I'm going to do the finishing talk now. 
So uh, if you like the video, like it, because that will tell the algorithm that, uh, you know, I'm here doing stuff and they'll send more viewers this way, you know. And if you want to know when the next videos come out, in other words, if I've grabbed you, this is called the marketing funnel, right? You might be a casual listener to just clicked on this video, you'll just watch one video and you might go, hmm, I quite like this guy. Well, then you need to subscribe, you need to subscribe. But YouTube's changed the algorithm. They're not, they're not considering subscriptions so much now. They're not pushing it that way because they're trying to bring new stuff up, especially in the area of shorts. So if you really want to see it, because YouTube might not let you know, you need to ring the notification bell. And nobody ever rings the notification bell, but I have asked you to do it. But if you ring it, then you'll get told when I'm um, bringing out another wonderful video like this. All my videos are wonderful, everyone will tell you. So, you know, press that because I won't let you down. I'll always be doing something interesting. I won't just have these filler videos that all the other YouTubers do. I'll, I'll, I'll be going all over the place and all that type of thing. So ring the notification bell. Now, if you want to give me money because you like me so much, you think, I like that Andy, and I want to get my hard-earned hard cash and give it to Andy, right? Because he doesn't seem to have that much money. I've, I've, I've seen little things. He's, he's not he's sat in a studio like Rick Beato is. He's not in that sort of place. So I'm going to send him a little bit of money. Well, you can do that by supporting me on Patreon. And then you'll get something for your money. A whole ton of stuff. And um, what can I say about my Patreon? I love my Patreon. They're, they're my friends now in Patreon. We chat. We, we, we meet up. We like film videos. And we put them on the YouTube channel. I can send you know, share all sorts of weird stuff, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place, Patreon, and that really is the future for artists, and I might do a video of that, I might, might, might be next Sunday, next Sunday, I might have a chat with, about Patreon, but why should I, you know, they don't pay me to do it, um, if you really want to just chuck money at me for no reason whatsoever, and give me that lovely warm feeling of waking up in the morning and realising something's, someone's dropped me 10 quid in my tip jar, I have a tip jar there and it's called Andy Edwards YouTube tip jar and it's actually PayPal so if you've got PayPal and you've got 50p you can click on that and you can send me a message right um, I won't answer any of these messages but I will read them I promise you um, I am getting inundated by messages I'm getting inundated by emails asking me to listen to different albums and all that. it's wonderful and I absolutely love it but I am spending a couple of hours a day trying to get through all the comments on YouTube, trying to get through all the emails, the messages, and uh, the, 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 the messages from the tip jar. So all I can say, if you have done that, I really do appreciate it, and I have seen it, and I am really so happy that people are so wonderful and like what I do that they're gonna stick a little bit of their hard and cash, you know. And I know I crack jokes about it, and I do that because I know you like it, but deep down, I feel honored to be here in this place, this privileged place where I've actually for the first time in my career, got people actually listening to me. <laughs> so, finished. That's the end of this one. See you on the next one. Bye.